we're starting up now. Welcome to the first official March for Man Australia. Now what we're going to do is we're going to start as we do to thank the best country in the world. We're going to start with the Australian Anthem. So please, quiet and respectful for the Australian Anthem. is a very special woman, a lady who's made this happen. You know, for so long we've needed this, but it's taken a woman to stand up for men. So put your hands together for one of the strongest women I know, one of the bravest women who copped so much crap for doing this, Sydney Watson! Stuff. First and foremost, I want to thank all the friends and family that helped me put this together because, let's be real guys, I'm just one person, so I know that a lot of you are really thankful to me, but there's so many people behind the scenes that worked on this that are amazing, so... Oh, sorry, there we go. Um, so I'd also like to thank the cops for being here. God knows that they have to put up with a lot of crap from the left, um, so hand a round of applause for those guys. I apologize. I want to thank you guys for being here because, like I said, I'm just one person. I can facilitate this. I can put it together. I can get absolutely have my head handed to me by the media, by the left, but it's you guys standing right here. You guys are the ones who matter because you're the ones who are standing up. Thank you. <laughs> why this was important, why I wanted to do the March for Men. And there's no one answer. And the reality is that there's so many things in this country, so many great things that our men and boys do, and so many things that they should be recognized for doing. And for me, this march is not about division. It's not about causing any angst or any hostility towards women or, to, or between men and women. What this march is about is demonstrating that the men here, the women here, we're better together. We're better when we work together. I'm, I'm an incredibly lucky woman because I've grown up with the best father on the planet and an incredible, incredible older brother as well. I have amazing male friends around me, most of which are probably standing here being a bit embarrassed, but uh, I'm so blessed, and I'm sure that many of the men who are here today as well have women around them too who feel blessed to have you in their lives. And I think it's important that you remember that. It doesn't matter what the media say, it doesn't matter what, how they present you, if they call you collectively rapists or, or murderers or violent, we know that's not true. We know that that's a very small portion of people in this country that behave like that, we know that. But it's okay for you guys to stand out once in a while and be counted. It's okay for you to stand up and have your rights listened to and have your issues addressed because there are things that uniquely affect men and there are things in this country that uniquely affect women as well. We know that. 
but men's issues matter as well, and that's what this march is about. It's demonstrating that you guys standing here, even the people who didn't come today, all the people who wanted to come today, your issues matter as well, and that's all I wanted to get across. Women, you guys, I'm, I'm so happy there are women here because you guys give this validity, and it's unfortunate that men on their own can't do that, but the women here, thank you so much for coming. Round of applause for you girls. Round of Like I've said, I've never been about hurting anyone or dividing people because I just, I love this country. I love the people in this country. I love my friends and family that are here. You guys are amazing. But at the end of the day, if we want change, we want actual, real, legitimate change, we need to actually stand up and be counted once in a while. It's okay for the crazy leftists to scream into the wind and to say that this, this country is misogynistic and, and we hate women and women have no rights, which is not the case. I am a woman standing here today telling you that women have the same rights as men. It is ridiculous to suggest that we don't. things that might be harder for women, I can tell you that there is an opposite that's harder for men. So at the end of the day, if we want to change this country and we want to be better and we want to stand together and make things more united, make things more, I guess, solidarity, have solidarity come through and shine through, what's more important is recognizing that both of our issues matter. And I don't want to take up too much time because we've got some absolutely amazing speakers and I'm so happy to have them here. But I love you guys. And I can't thank you enough for being here. Let's do something cool. Come on, a big round of applause for Sydney Watson. but actually, considering I know them quite well, I might just do that myself. So our first speaker is Jared, who is an incredible young man. He is a musician, which I think is pretty cool. Um, the reason that I know Jared actually is because he, the reason that I know Jared is because I interviewed him for a story that I was writing. And the story actually happened to center around men that have experienced uh, violence and sexual assault. So for Jared, I want to introduce him and bring him out to talk to you guys. Don't pay attention to the crazies. They're just here to scream into the wind, which is what they're super good at. Just ignore them. And everyone give a round of applause for Jared. Hello. Hey, guys. Before I thought about writing this, I had a talk with Sydney about the speech because I was stressing so much about what I was going to say. I don't identify with any political compass and I didn't want my personal views to affect or clash with the principles of the crowd Sydney draws. To which Sydney said that there's no need to worry because the event is completely impartial. And after a long time of backspacing, rewriting, stressing, thinking about the right words to say, I realized my stresses and my viewpoints meeting conflict only happen from a sense of anxiety because people are presuming I am either right wing or left wing. Or because I am this, or because I am that, or because I'm standing here, I have to have a particular opinion to satisfy them and everyone here. And I let go of this idea because I realized that that exact same prejudice is the reason why men and women are experiencing such a disparity. I have wrote a list of things that I picked up scrolling through Facebook and in various groups and threads, and of course, these were all based on socio-political topics. And I grabbed some of these comments and I read of people talking about the other gender, both male and female, and I've rewarded them as questions, and I feel as if this would be a better approach in a time when we're making assumptions and we're all visibly scared of each other. When a young woman is told her school uniform should be more concealing because the boys around her can't control her sexual impulses, how does that make a woman feel? When a boy is raped by his teacher, but she doesn't get sentenced because she is a very respected person in society, how does that make the men, the men feel. And did you know that when a, did you know that a young woman had her identity leaked from the Queensland police to her abusive ex-boyfriend that raped, beat, and tortured her with all evidence proving her legitimacy after moving twice to escape him? How does that make women feel? Did you know? Did you know that recently a man was killed because he tried going to a domestic abuse shelter to escape an abusive ex-girlfriend? but was turned away because he was male and he went back home only to be murdered and this did not receive any media attention whatsoever. How does that make men feel? How do we feel about suicide statistics in men 
but in the same breath, how do we feel about rape statistics in women? Take your time, buddy. It's okay. Take your time. <laughs> Just a little bit. It's a little bit nervous. Thank you so much, guys. I really appreciate it. As we go back and forth between the worst parts of each other, you begin to see how many issues amongst men and women are devastating. And although not exactly the same, carrying an equal amount of damages. Women teachers raping boys but not being sentenced. Men raping women, being punished but then being granted bail. It's all contrasted opposites to the same coin in the same context. And this is how it is. my own forms of abuse from both genders, sexually, mentally, emotionally, and physically. My closest friends and family watched, almost watched me commit suicide a couple of months ago. And a lot of people do not know what I've suffered with because in my own time, I just deal with it. And it was because I was ostracized a lot for my peers and authority figures, minimizing my issues for a multitude of reasons. And, uh, sorry, give me a second. <laughs> I was also strived a lot for my peers and authority figures, minimizing my issues for a multitude of reasons, but a big one of them being because I was male, and I projected a lot of negativity because of this, and I did a lot of things I regret. And throughout this time, I watched the disparity of men and women become larger as more men and women were abused, killed, or systematically ruined, only to be forgotten in the next month through all the arguing, and, for, and from all the anger, prejudice, anxiety, and hatred. I know that's not what we're about. I stand here as a victim, now turned proudly survivor, not because of anyone in particular, but because of the men and women who came around me in my time of need when I reached out for it. And there has been, there has never been a time in our existence as human beings where men and women needed each other most. But on a brighter note, if we're celebrating men, but on, a brighter, but on a brighter note, if we are celebrating men, I just wanted to say I'm proud of you for holding yourself together. I'm proud that we have come to a point that it is more acceptable amongst each other to talk about our emotions. Every day, I see a post on Blokes Advice about men who are struggling through depression and talk of killing themselves, be supported, and receive nothing but love from, and receive nothing but love from unknown mates connected by a group online. And there are women who are proud of us for that too. The only way we can see a peaceful resolution between male and female is not to take responsibility of actions of rapists, king hit cowards and other men who intend to harm, but to take responsibility in reciprocating and learning self-awareness for ourselves and women. You begin to understand yourself more when you are emotionally confronting, thus creating clarity between you and the people around you. There is no weakness in it, it is rather a sign of strength. On the last night, thank you guys for being here today. Loving one another as the brothers and sisters we are. We stand strongly together, and when you are met with hatred and prejudice, and even when you are the victim, don't succumb to it. Don't feed the negative ideologies. Uh, be, a man and, be a man about it, as I say. Be calm and in control. Take understanding approaches, and with persistence you will find that there are plenty of women and men who just want the same thing as us. We have never been enemies, and we never will be. We're all in this together. And for celebrating them. Thank you guys. A big round of applause for Jim! Good on you, mate. That was great. Beautiful. So we've got a couple of clowns on the side who, who think they know how to chant. So we're gonna we're gonna give them a little chant of our own. March for men, respect for all! March for men, respect for all! March for men, respect for all! I'll let uh, Sydney introduce because... Avi doesn't know. Avi has no idea 99% of the time. You don't know that, but I'm going to tell you guys. So, our next speaker is 
Robert Brockway, who is a veteran in men's rights. He is an incredible human being, a brilliant human being. He has a young daughter, and he told me recently, and I'm sorry for outing you on this, he does a lot of this for her, because he wants a better society for men, boys, and his daughter, and women, because we're so much better together. Give it up for Robert. Thank you very much, Sidney. Thank you. Mansplaining, manspreading, manterrupting, manslamming, appropriating, man flu. The male immune system is weaker. He's a man child, and it's variation. He's a man baby. Toxic masculinity, the end of men. Men are obsolete. A curfew for men. Deadbeat dads. Men are genetically inferior. Men have a lower pain threshold. Men are linear thinkers. Men can't multitask. Men lack the capacity to main concentration, maintain concentration for long periods. I apparently have to talk louder. Men think about sex every few seconds. Masculinity so fragile. Fragile male, male ego, male privilege, patriarchy. Men won't ask for directions. I wonder how I found my way here. <laughs> Special Persons Day rather than Father's Day. Men should man up and grow some balls. A woman needs a man like a fish needs a bicycle. Boys are stupid throw rocks at them. During this talk, I sometimes reference issues men and boys face are uh, facing in other countries. When one wealthy Anglosphere country goes to goes with the others soon follow. In any case, we're all in this together, whether we're talking about Australia, the US, Canada, or Haiti or Venezuela. Misandry and the attacks on men and masculinity must stop. We live in a society that marginalizes men and their problems, that routinely ridicules men and boys. We hear about mansplaining, in which men are presumed to routinely talk down to women and explain topics to them after uh, that they already understand. The concept, but not the term, was first discussed by author Rebecca Solnit after a man apparently explained a book to her, not knowing that she had read it. That terrible man being unable to read her mind. And then there are some less well-known examples. Man interruption, in which is it alleged that men interrupt women when just speaking more than the other way around. Some fairly dubious research has gone into that one. Most people probably haven't heard of man slamming, which claims that men seek to dominate footpaths and simply slam into women while walking around. A young woman tried to popularize this by walking around and slamming into men. The End of Men is an article, subsequently a book, written by Hannah Rosen. Rosen covers some of the issues facing men and boys, but goes on to argue that these problems have their basis in fundamental problems with being male. Meanwhile, the monk debates in Canada, which are broadcast around the world, had an episode called Men Are Obsolete, in which four women, but no men, debated whether men are obsolete or not. Someone asked me at the end how the audience voted. Here in Australia, we've recently had calls for a curfew for men, including a newspaper article entitled A Curfew for Men? What a Great Idea! by Melinda Houston that appeared in various Australian newspapers, including the Sydney Morning Herald. Setting aside for a moment what a ridiculous and practical idea this is, it clearly shows that the actions of a few men are reflected on men as a whole. I'm fairly certain that Miss Houston wasn't serious, but it doesn't matter. The damage is done. Gender relations in Australia have further deteriorated. Deadbeat dads. Let's spare a thought for the dads that haven't seen their kids in years because of a dysfunctional family court system. Returning recently was a chestnut that has done the rounds for many years, that men are genetically inferior to women. 
These claims usually come about as suggesting that the Y chromosome is somehow defective and is ultimately doomed. These claims can occur because the Y chromosome is smaller than the X chromosome and contains fewer genes. These sorts of simplistic claims show a fundamental misunderstanding of genetics. Every difference between the men and women comes, directly or indirectly, from the Y chromosome. To claim that the Y chromosome is a disadvantage for men is to reject everything that is to be male and to reject all of the achievements of men now and in the past. We've even reached the point where well-known columnist Dol uh, Dolly, sorry, excuse me, Polly Dunning stated in an article in the Sydney Morning Herald, there were dark moments in the middle of the night, this is why she's pregnant, there are dark moments in the middle of the night when all those dark thoughts come, when I felt sick at the thought of something male growing inside me. That's a direct quote. In the article, Dunning explained her change of heart following the birth of her son, but I still find her comments truly disturbing. Indeed, she sets out to raise her son a feminist. Men and boys are often portrayed as stupid. The TV formula, so often seen in sitcoms, of a stupid or inept but often well-meaning man married to a superwoman who can solve all of his problems for him by the end of the episode is so common it is a cliché. The mass media is so full of negative portrayals of men, the news media is constantly telling us about negative aspects of masculinity. This has led to a general perception of men as people to be feared and suspected. This has led many airlines to maintain a policy of never seating unaccompanied minors next to men. The implicit assumption here seems to be that men cannot be trusted next to a child. Many men report feeling uneasy around children, fearful that they will be accused of some terrible act. This is a major cause of men avoiding industry, certain industries, such as childcare and teaching. A series of t-shirts and other products produced in the United States a few years ago suggested boys are stupid, throw rocks at them. These t-shirts can be found in Australia. The manufacturers took no regard for the impacts their products would have on young minds. So I want to touch on a few, a few selected issues. Reproductive choice is something that a lot of people don't realise is a men's issue. Women in most nations have the right to choose not to be a parent. This right exists through the option to have an abortion, through the use of adoption, or through the use of safe haven drop-off points. Many jurisdictions allow the mother to use any of these options without the wishes of the father. In contrast, for, most, for men, consent to sex is consent to parenthood. Today, men actually lack reproductive rights. Unlike women in many Western countries, men cannot choose not to be a father. In the United States, which is a little ahead of us on, on this issue, I must admit, in the United States there have been many cases in which a boy has been raped by an adult woman. The, the boy was not legally able to consent to the sexual activity because he was underage, and yet the woman became pregnant and the boy was required to pay child support, including back payments on reaching the age of 18. Many men have been ordered by courts to continue supporting a child that is not theirs, even after they present conclusive evidence, such as the results of a DNA test, showing that they are not the biological child and father of the child, and in some cases had no relationship to the child at all. We want men to have the same reproductive choices that women currently enjoy. Bodily autonomy is also another serious issue. In most nations today, women gain the right to genital integrity at birth. In an increasing number of nations, this right is actively enforced for girls. Boys eventually gain this right too, but the exact age at which this occurs isn't clear. We do know that boys do not have this right at the age of five in the US, we just don't know what age that is in Australia. Female genital mutilation is now illegal in many countries, and international organisations work to reduce this practice. These same societies often refuse to grant boys, boys the same bodily integrity, the same bodily autonomy that they grant girls. The right to be protected from unnecessary medical procedures. We object to male genital mutilation, also known as circumcision, on the same grounds as female genital mutilation. Both violate the human rights of the person being mutilated and both should be illegal. In many countries today, all people have protection from unnecessary medical procedures except being from boys. 
Many do not know that the foreskins of infant boys are not destroyed as medical waste as are following circumcision, but rather are put to a variety of uses. While it is true a few are used for medical research, the majority go to cosmetic companies. In some countries, the sale of foreskins by hospitals is a lucrative business. We want boys to have the same rights to bodily integrity that girls currently enjoy. Women have always known that they are the mothers of the child they gave birth to. Only recently have men had the chance to know that they are the parent of a particular newborn. In some countries such as France, paternity testing is illegal unless permitted by a court of law, and the authority is almost never granted. We want men to have the same certainty of parenthood that women currently enjoy. This could be achieved through mandatory paternity testing at birth. Next I wanted to cover presumption of innocence. The Me Too movement has seen countless men tried in the court of public opinion without so much as a cursory investigation in many cases. We can see serious issues with police ignoring expulsory evidence in sexual assault investigations in the UK and elsewhere. We might see this here too. Perhaps it is already happening. The affirmative consent and enthusiastic consent laws now being enacted around Australia shift the burden of proof and leave men who have had sex with women at the mercy of those women and the judicial system. If a complaint is made against a man, he is now left trying to establish the woman had consented. The burden of proof has changed. Male disposability is the tendency for societies to be more willing to sacrifice men than women. It does not mean that society will wantonly throw away the lives of men, but rather it should mean that if, if we must choose between sacrificing a man or sacrificing a woman, society will generally choose to sacrifice the man. This manifests in a variety of ways. Societies throughout history have expected men to give up their lives for women and children even when, that they are not related, when they're not related to them or even know them. When someone is in trouble, societies expect men to be the ones to step up and risk their lives and safety to help people they don't know. This is still very common, although largely invisible. While Australia has talk, was talking about toxic mas masculinity and a curfew for men, every single person risking their lives in that cave in Thailand was a man. It would have been the same if it was a girls team rather than a boys team in danger. Recently, two, two men in South America spent days in the wilderness to find a Western woman who had been lost. That wasn't big news. I'm not sure anyone even said thank you. And Boko Haram have killed boys for years and no one cared. They kidnapped girls and it was, it was global news. I've just been advised I need to roll things along a little bit. Much has been made of negative qualities ascribed to men. These characteristics are often grouped under the heading toxic masculinity and ultimately lead to ridiculous claims like a curfew for men. But there is another side to all of this. The many positive qualities that men bring to societies, their communities and their families. Men are far more likely to help women, even women they don't know, than ever to harm a woman. Now, Now when we talk about a father here, we might be talking about a biological father, or a stepfather, or perhaps a father figure. But not everyone can, can be, not everyone can have an involved father of course, but that doesn't take away from the fact that, that many children will benefit from an involved father figure in their lives. And that by extension, the involvement of men in their children's lives benefits society as a whole. Yeah, yeah, children with involved fathers, benefit in a number of ways. This list is not intended to be exhaustive. Children with involved fathers commit fewer crimes than those without. This is also true of violent crimes. Children with involved fathers also commit less bullying. They're also less likely to experience depression and anxiety, partly because they are less likely to engage in illicit drug use. Women who grew up with involved fathers showed lower incidence of pre-teen pre 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 pregnancy, as well as a better and more stable relationships with men in later in life. Research has also found that women with involved fathers tend to be less likely to be derogatory towards men and boys. Harvey, you'd like me to finish, wouldn't you? Can I tell one little story? So I, had, I was going to talk some more, and then I was going to tell you the story. But before concluding, I'd like to finish up with a brief story. Back in 1137, 
the castle of Weinsberg in Germany had endured a long siege. Finally, surrender of the castle was negotiated. All of the women would be permitted to leave the castle, while the men remaining inside would be executed. The women would be permitted to take out as much as they could carry on their backs. Soon after, the castle gate opened and each woman stepped out, labouring under the weight on her back. For each woman was carrying her husband. King Conrad, who was leading the army besieging the castle, was impressed by this clever deception and let the women pass unimpeded. The misandry so common in society today devalues men and boys. It focuses on the negatives only. Rather, we need widespread recognition that we're all in this together and that women will not be better off in a society where men have failed. It's time to stop the shaming of men and boys. It's time to stop the name calling. It's time for the entire community to come together and end misandry. Before I head it off to Sydney again, who's got a couple of words to give you, we're going to have a couple more chance to encourage our neighbours. March for men, respect for all! 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 Can't hear you. March for men, respect for all! March for men, respect for all! Bloody man, I can't do two things at once. I was trying to chew a... Last one. Does, does anybody here hate women? Anyone? No! No one here hates women, Antifa! No one here cares about your ridiculous, ridiculous arguments! Maybe if you guys got jobs and contributed, you would know what we And I just want to let you guys know this. The love over here is crazy, and we outnumber you three to one! That being said, everyone, and I'm just going to take this intermission to get really mad because these guys are the most ridiculous people on the planet, and I think you all know that. They don't contribute anything. They, uh, they uh, live off of the taxpayer, people like you and me, who pay our taxes. And I'm going to go into the next speaker now. We have Shani, who is an incredible woman, mother of three sons, three incredible sons. And she's had some experiences in a domestic violence shelter. She has a really unique experience as a woman, not someone who's been ever abused by a man, as far as I understand, Shani, no. She hasn't. That's the truth. So we're going to pass over to her and uh, have a listen to what she has to say. Thank you so much, Sydney. And thank you everybody for getting out here today for men. It's wonderful to see so many who are passionate about gender equality getting out here today, including them. Even if we have different ideas about what equality means or how to achieve that equality, I know that each and every one of us is here because we care about people's rights. We care about the future, right? domestic violence too. Yes. Yes. We care about domestic violence too. Yes. But for many, and I think we're all thankful that this is the case, their only perspective of domestic violence comes from the media or from their schooling. Yeah. This perspective misses so much though. You could say it's lacking in diversity. Yeah. And that diversity of perspectives is crucial. It's the only way to discern truth and to ensure we get the best policies for everybody. So today I'd like to give you the perspective of someone who's been inside a domestic violence shelter. We hear so much about violence against women, but not so much about domestic violence shelters. And this is strange considering that these shelters are refuges 
are the single most important way for families to escape domestic abuse. With the exception of the one Robert spoke about earlier, that's, sorry, some of you may have heard that there are no refuges in Australia where a man and his children can go to escape abuse. With the exception of one that Robert was talking about earlier, that is true. But that's not what I'm going to talk about. Thank you. domestic violence refuge. In fact, I've been in two. There is so much that I could say about my time there, but for today, I'd like to talk about how I left one of those shelters. And I can understand why they don't want anybody to be able to hear what I'm about to say. together with my three young children. The youngest was just a baby at the time. The older boys were six and seven. The father of my children wasn't violent though, at all. This isn't one of those stories. He'd just become gravely ill, like so many men who'd worked too hard for too long in a dangerous job He'd become too sick to work, and then he became too sick for me to care for him. We weren't coping. I wasn't coping. So we were going to stay with my mother. Now, I love my mother. I do. But she's an alcoholic, a binge drinker, and she has serious mental health issues that have caused a long history of, of violence, not just domestic violence. They used to pick her up in the paddy wagon and take her to the hospital instead of the police station because she was so unwell. <sighs> but she is my mother. She'd been sober for a few months and we had nowhere else to go. So I had our bags all packed, new school arranged for the older boys and my mother turned up drunk to pick us up. She arrived in a van being driven by a man who was even more drunk than she was. I'd never seen him or heard of him before and there was no way I was gonna put my children in that van and my mother didn't like that at all. I sent the children inside and after some drama, she left and rang children's services. I think she really believed they would order us to stay with her. It took children's services, community services, if that's what it's called down here, a while to call me, and that was a really awful time. But when they did, and after hearing our situation, they sent us to the domestic violence refuge. I was so incredibly grateful. I was thinking about staying in a tent. And I was surprised to learn that we weren't the only ones there due to a woman's violence. Far from it. But the policies of the refuges don't reflect that. One of the first things we were told when we were there was that no man under any circumstances was allowed to know where we were. They couldn't even know the street name. No taxi drivers, no delivery men. And this refuge was in one of those suburbs that isn't well serviced by shops. They had one of those little supermarkets with no fresh produce. And I was still in the process of changing the boys' school again, still travelling for five hours a day by public transport to get them all the way over the, over the other side of the city to their old school. I had no time to find food. So I turned to the one support person in the world that we had, the man I made three beautiful children together with, Ross. Thank you. He was so unwell at the time, but he dragged himself out of bed and helped us get a week's worth of grocery shopping home. Now when I say home, 
I mean to the main road that was three blocks away from the refuge. I knew the rules and I showed him where to stop, but in his state, he was a little slow to pull up. I actually told him to move and that started a small argument and our oldest son got out of the car, so I got out to get him. It seemed too late to move, so we just got the shopping out. Ross said goodbye to the kids and left. We were seen. We were seen, I don't know how, but we were ordered to leave because of it. It didn't matter that Ross wasn't the violent one. It didn't matter that he hadn't seen the refuge itself. It didn't matter that I had no sisters or family, friends could have done what Ross did for us that day. None of that mattered. He was a man and so we were kicked out. And I had to explain that to our oldest son. He was such a beautiful child. Huge brown eyes, very kind and justice minded. He needed to know why we needed to leave. I told him it was because daddy had dropped us off where he could see the street. And my son wanted to know why that was wrong. Did daddy do something bad, he asked. And I told him, no, daddy's done nothing wrong. He said, well, we can tell them that daddy's good. And I told him, I'd already told them that, honey. The rule is for all men. And then he asked me something that really made my heart ache. He said, are all men bad? said no and I told him this was just the refuge rule but my son was one of those kids who really knew how to ask why he was so upset that we were being kicked out he knew we had nowhere to go he wanted to know how to stop it happening again so he kept asking why do we have to leave why are no men allowed are all men bad and finally, if men aren't bad, why do we have to leave? I told him again that it was just their rule, but he was onto something. And I wish I could describe the look on his face when the realization sank in. It was so painful. And he said, will I be a bad man when I grow up? Before I could even say, no, honey. His eyes welled up and he said, I don't want to be a bad man. He was seven. His little brother who was there absorbing every word was only six. He knew what he meant and I knew what he meant. My son had caught a glimpse of his own future through the eyes of our society and it scared him. It scared me too. As a mother, I was completely unprepared to help him in that moment. All I could do was hold him. I wanted to reassure him and have him believe that he could only ever be judged by his actions. But I couldn't even assure him we had a place to stay that night. We were being made to leave the refuge simply because the only person we could rely on for support was a man. A man who'd done nothing wrong. <laughs> they needed in order to determine him an unacceptable threat was his gender. They gender profiled the father of my children. That's not equality. And I've since learned that we're not alone. Other women have been kicked out of refuges for the same thing. And not only that, the no men allowed rule extends to post pubescent boys. So if you're mother with a 12 year old son and you need the help of a refuge, you're stuck. If Rosie Batty had taken her 12 year old son to a refuge to protect him from the violent death, the refuges would have turned him away to die regardless. That's how much they disrespect masculinity. 
I've learned that the refuges now refuse to take any child over the age of 12. And I have to ask if that's our anti-discrimination laws at work. Instead of ensuring mothers with post-pubescent sons aren't discriminated against, it now ensures that all families with children aged 12 and over have no access to domestic violence refuges. They're stuck in violent homes. We were stuck back at my mother's place for another four years after that. Finally, my brother was able to give us the help we needed to escape and we never looked back. But the scars from that took that time took so many years to heal. But if the effect of these rules and policies on women and girls is being stuck in violent homes, the situation for boys and men is utter devastation. It's hard to see a future for yourself in a society that casts you as the villain. And my son definitely struggled there. It was like his future had been taken from him. While our experience is not that common, I want everyone here to understand that what my son learned that day in the refuge is the same thing all Australian boys are learning now when they see the way we treat and view men. The Stop It at the Start television commercial where the boy slams a door in a little girl's face, it actively encourages this mental connection between men and a violent and menacing threat. And that message has been to every home. Our children are now learning this in schools. In presenting masculinity in such a negative light, we're teaching boys that to grow up to be a man means to become a bad person. We're teaching them that, to, that nothing they can do can alter that. This encourages boys and men to withdraw. It wrecks their sense of self. They're offered no incentive to work for the good of us all because we cast them out from the very meaning of us all with slogans like the future is female. When we look into our son's eyes, we know that what they're hearing isn't true, but they need to know it. Our sons need to know that they're welcome in our world, that they can contribute something that's valued and appreciated, and that they can do so without having to change who they are. They need to know that gender equality means justice regardless of gender. to know that. Yeah. Our sons need to know that our future is human, inclusive of men, their perspectives, their masculinity. It's time we took our future back. Yeah. Thank you very much. A big round of applause. We're going to move quickly. The next speaker is going to do it in a, in a rush because we need to get moving, otherwise we're not going to be allowed to march. So, Rob, smash it up. Thanks, Abby. Where are all the extremists? You guys don't look like extremists to me. Yeah, okay. I'm supposed to kiss the mic. So my name's Rob. I've been working as a counselor for the past 10 years. I've been a in the media a bit recently because I lost my job for basically acknowledging that men are victims of domestic violence as well. Uh, I work a lot with... <laughs> I work a lot with men, I work a lot with couples, and what I've observed is Generally speaking, it takes two to tango. I'm not saying... I'm not saying that's all the time. There's obviously situations uh, that are bad. So I lost my job 
I've been in the spotlight a bit, and I'm using it to bring attention to the state of men in Australia, as I've seen it. I've had the opportunity to eavesdrop on the lives of men, the lives of boys, the lives of couples, for a long time now. And from what I've seen, there's a lot of men struggling. There's a lot of men having a real hard time. And with regards to the politics of things, with regards to a lot of mental health organizations that are based in the community, their treatment programs are based on a particular brand of feminism that's outdated. It's outdated and it's not working. Bad behavior comes from both sides. Yeah. A lot of the time. Yeah. That's, there's international academic research backing that statement up. It's common knowledge. But it's being ignored by the people who make the big decisions. Which means what? It means that couples, it means that men are not receiving the kind of interventions, the kind of support that are actually effective, that actually work, that actually improve relationships. So I'll wrap this up. I, uh, I've written a speech, and my, my colleagues here, my previous speakers, they, they actually covered all the topics. Um, what I will say in working with men, for as long as I have, what you can do is pay attention to the blokes around you to the close men in your lives. Watch the signs, the red flags. If the red flags and the signs outnumber the signs that they're actually coping, what are you gonna do? You're gonna say something. What else are you gonna do? You're gonna listen, nice. Check in with the important men in your lives. Care about them. What do men do when we ask them, how are you doing, and they're not doing so great? How might they respond? Yeah. yeah. So just to wrap, apparently the police are breathing down our neck. Thank you, police, by the way. So care about the men in your lives. Look for the signs that they're struggling and help them find male-friendly support. Male-friendly support that works for men. Take care of the men in your lives. And men, let's take care of ourselves. Let's take care of each other. Thank you. Because uh, we want to march, and the only way we can march is if we do this really, really quickly. So follow the leaders. We're going to go that way before Antifa catches up. Go! March for men! Respect for all! March for men! March for men! Respect for all! March for men! Respect for all! March for men! Respect for all!
champ like what a girl. What's the other one? <laughs> what was his other champ? Uh, oh, yeah. oh, man! You guys can go that side of it. Oh, oh,
That's it, guys. Thanks very much. Good on you for the good behavior. Thank you.